So let me start. And um, so I got a feeling that people at some point got confused, but you know I will try to, you know, remove the confusion. But you know I don't know. We will see. But the things will get more complicated. So I basically recommend you that you understand the general structure details you have to understand by yourself. So what I started yesterday to talk about index. So my goal is now. So today. I want to do two things. So I want to tell you about index calculations and also bit some of geometry, and then try to apply this for 3D theory, which is basically a toy example of 5D theory. And tomorrow I will tell you about 5D, so full-scale calculation. So we are discussing with you index theorems. And um, the main thing is that what I told you that we are interested that in the operator D, so which is elliptic operator, elliptic operator. And um, then we are interested in that for elliptic operator. So I'm reminding that on compact, compact manifold. This is Fred Holm. So then for operator, you can define the index of operator, which is the same as dimensions of the kernel minus dimensions of co-kernel of D. So just that you know this is the same as dimensions of kernel of D dagger. Okay. Uh, so the magical thing is that about this hopper, I mean, typically this index, that uh, this is topological quantity. This is not, but this is, is. So let me give you, I mean, let me suggest I came last night, uh, I mean, just some good exercise to do. Very simple exercise, but sort of very nice to see. So consider S1, okay? And then consider the following operator. Well, lambda is a complex number. So please calculate for this operator uh, index and also calculate dimensionality of uh, kernel of D and dimensionality of kernel of D dagger. So in this example, what you will see that uh, as you are, so your answer what is magical is what is good in this example that uh, these things will be always the same for whatever lambda is. These things will change as for different lambdas because you have to find the solutions and of course because you're solving this in the circle you have to impose periodicity. And it may not work for arbitrary lambda. So these things may change as you change parameters of your operator. This does not change. This will be always the same number. So that's why it's topological invariant. So in a way, what is important that this thing depends more on topology of this thing and it does not depend very much on this operator. Okay. So this is one important thing when I talk about index theorems. So this is one exercise. So basically, uh, if I'm talking, so typically the index theorem, the standard thing is that it's called ITIA, both theorem. And again, I'm skipping details. I will give you just a uh, rough idea. But roughly speaking, it's the following. That uh, this guy, so this is typically called, when you solve it, it's called analytical index. Analytical index. So in principle, like in this problem, you're supposed to actually solve uh, your problem and count solutions. This is equal to some quantity. I, I mean, let me not explain this very much. So uh, basically, this is generalized uh, Gauss-Bonnet theorem. So this, if you want, this is some characteristic classes. Classes. 
So in principle, if you want to calculate the index of operator, you have to construct some objects out of curvatures, etc., and calculate it. But this quantity is actually independent of, uh, of I mean, concrete connections you do, etc. So in a way, this is invariant. I mean, this is topological invariant. So for example, it may depend only on the bundle and things like this. So this is part typically called topological index. And the whole beauty of index theorem is just saying that analytical index equal to topological index. So the magical thing is the following, that if you actually want to calculate the, the difference between uh, dimensions of kernel and co-kernel, then eventually it depends only on topology. Okay. So actually, there are many variations of the theorem <laughs> with many names, you know, and different variations. So in principle, I mean, this you should not understand very literally because there are different classes, etc. And uh, depending on which operator you put, you put here Dalbu, you get one version of index theorem. You put here Dirac, you get slightly different, etc., etc. So in principle, uh, in uh, you know, in old days when this theorem was uh, you know proven, what you basically to to do the calculation, you need to know how to manipulate these uh, characteristic classes, etc. So just let me remind you because I will need this for generalization. So, so characteristic class is the following concept. So I will need a equivalent generalization of this. Um, so if I have uh, invariant polynomial, so I have invariant polynomial, which I can denote as just something on Lie algebra and it's invariant. So it's invariant on that joint action. Just let me give you example. So example, of course, uh, example. I mean, if I take, um, it depends for which group I'm doing, but for example, uh, definitely uh, Fafian would be a good polynomial uh, if I'm looking for just orthogonal group. So on the orthogonal group, it will work. Or different versions of determinant or trace. I mean, this will all give me a polynomials. Then typically uh, what I'm supposed to do, so I'm supposed to take this polynomial and then if, so I have my bundle, you know, I have for example some vector bundle of M and then I take this polynomial and I put some curvature in there. So pick up any connection, put a curvature, put it in and then basically why you call characteristic class because you can identify this this element of Dirac homology. So, as element of Dirac homology, this is independent of concrete connection you are choosing. So, there are standard theorems. Uh, so, this is typically called Chern Chernweil isomorphisms, uh, isomorphism, and this guy, as element in homology, is independent. So, you have to prove first of all that it's, for example, closed. Okay. And um, next thing is that you have to prove that if you change your connection, so in fixed bundle you change your connection by anything else, so you go from connection to connection, then this guy will change by D of something. So this is standard theorems. You can look at Nakahara how to prove it. It takes a couple of pages. But the important thing is that this is a way to produce something which is invariant. And then this object you take and you plug it in, etc. What I'm skipping, there is a whole list of classes depending on which group you take. I don't know if you chain characters, chain classes, etc. Okay. Then there is one important thing which would be important uh, also in applications. Um, so there is this notion of elliptic operator. There is also notion uh, of elliptic complex. I mean, in fact, this is a special case. I will tell you in a moment. So here, typically, what you're interested, so your operator, and here what you're interested in, typically, you have one bundle, 
you have another bundle and you look just some operator which acts from section to sections. So for example, I don't know, example. So think Dalbo operator which acts from zero to, I don't know, a one zero, right? So this is example, for example, operator. So in most of the examples, it's important that you write this. It's natural to continue the things. That's where notion of elliptic complex will typically arise. So you start and you write one bundle, you write another bundle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So now if you uh, want to talk about ellipticity of bundles, so you have an operator. I mean, in principle, it can be different operators. I don't know, D1, D2, etc. D, uh, whatever, M minus 1. So you have to actually look at the symbols. So you have to look at symbols of these guys, etc. And typically, you have to see that with respect to this symbol, this is exact sequence. That the kernel coincides with the image. Again, it's a matrix calculation. I mean, what I'm uh, telling you, it maybe sounds complicated, but it's not. So let me give you an example. Uh, again, this example, typically, whenever I have just one operator in F, I just always can make a complex by just writing these things. You can ask, why do I talk to you about this nonsense, etc. Uh, it's actually not nonsense because, uh, I mean, in gauge theories, we actually need a complex, not this. So uh, let me give you an example. And actually, I suggest you to calculate. So I hope you did exercise, right? Yesterday, you did this as a following exercise. It's from yesterday. I ask you to prove this thing, that this is elliptic operator, right? So this is, uh, these two equations, it's elliptic, elliptic PD. And again, here, I, I've just looked at a billion case for simplicity. So in principle, if it's non-abelian, we're interested in linearization of the problem. So now that actually uh, what I Pearson gauge theory, uh, this problem, I mean, when we will do calculations tomorrow for 5D theory, etc., then actually there is associated elliptic complex. So let me write for you the things. So this is exercise for today you can do. Uh, this is a bit more complicated, but still it's a linear algebra. So I have a one form on form manifold. Then uh, I have, um, sorry, zero form, one form, and then cell dual two forms. Again, when I'm writing complex, I can put always put here errors to zeros. So here it goes to DRAM, and this is goes to D plus. So D plus is just the following operation. So I'm just taking a plane one over two star, DRAM. So I apply first DRAM and then I project. So this is definition of D plus. So show that this complex is elliptic. So typically the thing is that these two problems is related the following way. You're dualizing these things. Again, sorry for confusion now, uh, I realized. So this is plus, this is plus, uh, this is dagger, okay? This is plus. So dagger, it means conjugated, so this is actually plus. So the two problems is related, you just fold this complex and you're doing like this. But in gauge theory, you actually, I mean, you have these things because these guys were your ghost seat. So in, in, in future, this is, will be, the field C, which is called ghost. And then it maps here, this would be a connection, and that would maps to here, this is would be typically the field chi, which I will tell you later on. So please show that this is complex elliptic. Basically what you have to write symbols of these guys and uh, show that this is exact sequence. If you're confused by any definition, just Google it. 
Yeah. What? This is a contract? Uh, it's just it's a definition of elliptic complex. That's how you define things. But the, uh, the composition of the dagger uh, together with the... One. I mean, you have to do decomposition the level of symbols. So if you will do it, I mean, symbol composed one guy with another guy will give you zero. I think you could just use the d plus as projector followed by d. So you get projector d squared, which is zero. Right. Google it, OK? The answer for everything is Google. So let me keep going because I am afraid that I would not have time. OK? Um, now, what else I wanted to tell you? So please do this exercise, and that would be important you know, for tomorrow. And again, it's not that complicated what you may be confused, uh, I mean, how to do it. But actually, write the symbols, and uh, you have to prove that kernel of one operation is coinciding with the image of another. So there is some linear algebra and some properties of self-dual forms. Okay, right. So why do we need this stuff, etc.? So actually, uh, this is very nice, but uh, I mean, uh, to work with these things, it's a bit complicated. What we actually need, we need a, a, a better version of this. Well, not better, but um, we need version when on the manifold we have some uh, symmetries. So we would like basically now to go to equivalent version of index theorems. Again, let me give you a warning that the subject, if you do it properly, it's a complicated subject. There are a lot of subtleties. So what I will do, I will give you a rough idea uh, how it works approximately. So if you want to study, you study this by yourself. You read books, etc. Uh, what actually for me will be important, I will work out some examples. And that's exactly examples which we use in physical theory. So right now my presentation, I'm not giving you anything systematic. I actually give you a rough idea how it's going to will happen. So now uh, in our story that whenever we would have a bundle, so the key thing is that now we'll have some action of the group. Typically it will be torus. So we'll have some action of the group here, G. Okay. So then I would like always that uh, this section will be lifted to the whole bundle. So the, it will be lifted here. So we'll deal with what I told you, equivalent bundles. So typically, again, I told you that you lift it, it should be compatible uh, with a typically projection and it should sort of act nicely on the fibers. And if it's principal bundle, then two actions should commute, etc. Okay. So then, uh, as I told you here, again, the story is the following. Then, whatever you do, usual geometry. So here, what you had, uh, you had a notion of uh, Diramka homology. You had a notion of connection, curvature. And for example, the way of producing characteristic classes was taking a curvature, plugging in an invariant polynomial, and getting element on cohomology, and then you're doing. So now you do exactly the same. You just attach to every word adjective equivalent. That's it. Uh, so it sounds simple, but of course it's not. So, uh, so you have to, to the bundle associate equivalent and connection. Typically, I don't know, I will use, uh, for example, this thing. So typically, it's a usual connection plus some formal guys, so my VA. So I have a vector fields V associated to this. So this would be current connection. And then my current curvature will be F G. So 
So in localization, when we'll discuss gauge theories, I will tell you more concretely what actually appearing. So what is important here to realize that, for example, curvature typically, I mean, if you look locally, usual curvature, it's a two form. Uh, now in a current story, it will be always two form and zero form. Okay. So this is formally, if I write the current curvature, and then the story is the following that, uh, so I have now my invariant polynomial, invariant polynomial, and then I will produce two, so I have to put an invariant polynomial, uh, basically this object. Okay. And now the statement is that whole thing is with churn while isomorphism follows, it just becomes now element of equivalent cohomology. So this is now equivalent cohomology. So again, my intention here is just display for you schematic things. I suggest that you study this yourself. But the story is very much similar like this. You will see in a moment what's a catch, why we are doing. Because right now, it's not a big deal. Okay? The thing is what is important, and this is very, very crucial, that it's element of equivalent cohomology, right? So if I would like to write some integral for you, m, on m, and then I put here something, whatever, m, f of a, g, right? Or some combination of them. The catch is the following, that if I write this, this will be killed by these guys because it's element in cohomology, right? And then during first lecture, I told you that if I have a form which is equivalently closed, then this just becomes nothing. So I apply now another formula, idea. Uh, what is idea? Uh, I forgot. What, uh, I mean, idea is everywhere. I mean, what's, uh, it's also bought. Sorry, this is actually called, I mean, it's, it's called, this is called Atiyah Singer. So index theorem is typically called Atiyah Singer, Atiyah Bot, it's a localization formula, sorry. So Atiyah Bot, what happens is the following, that it becomes a sum of a fixed points, and then, well, you get here whatever you have to evaluate your form at Laos degree. And then you get something here. So then, why we like with index theorems? Actually, we get a way to calculate things much faster. So what we actually need, we need to know, instead of calculating, so, yeah, question. Oh, I was just wondering if there's an, how things will depend on epsilon, epsilon a. They will depend on epsilon, absolutely. I mean, here I'm supposed to, you know, to be very pedantic, I'm supposed to okay, put this. Yeah, 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 yeah. As I said that I'm not giving mathematical lectures would require too much. I, I'm giving you ideas. So the whole thing is that this is complicated typically. You have to know a lot of topology. Uh, here, with the QRNs, actually everything will be reduced to fixed points. And then actually, I will give you an example that what you need to know, you need to know to calculate index theorems, basically information around fixed points. And life becomes very simple. Again, to arrive to this result, you need to know, to do a lot of math. But this is the idea why we like them, okay? So this is, um, Sorry, I may be missing the obvious here, but um, F is, F is a curvature, is, is a, Field strings, so it's essentially two form, isn't it? So how can a polynomial of a two form have like a zero form component? No, no. But this is what I'm saying is that uh, curvature anymore is not a two form. Oh. Curvature has two components now. It's a two form and zero form. One of the thing is that uh, you cannot solve. So what is important that if you think I told you how do you solve these conditions? I mean the way to solve these conditions it's only to have combination of two forms. So in supersymmetry, I don't know if you saw already, there will be always this localization locus. 
In whatever dimensions you have, you will have this. So the statement about this is the following, that this is actually the following thing. So this is correct notion of a curvature now. So your characteristic class, so for example, if you want to uh, do the thing, so for example, your characteristic class would be a trace, so first chain class, a current first chain class will be a trace of f plus phi. And now the thing is when you will calculate everything, so in principle, uh, you know, integral of these things will depend on the values of phi at fixed points. But whatever theory you take, you will always have this uh, locus as one of localization. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. I mean, it's always will be a part. I mean, the current bundles everywhere in, in uh, supersymmetric localization. Okay. Uh, right. So let me say a bit of more general nonsense and then try to go to examples because it's in a way more productive. Um, right. So basically, if I want to uh, give you the version of index theorem, so the analog of that formula, so let me write to you the following. So index of d bar operator for the twisted bundle, I, because all my examples will be about uh, Dalbo operator. That's because we need for three and f uh, f three and five D calculations. So this is basically evaluated at at the group element. This would becomes one over two pi i, and and then there will be integral over tot class equivalent uh, T M and chain class of my bundle. Again, everything now becomes equivalent. So you replace everything by equivalent. Now, if you apply next further on Atiyabot theorem, then actually what you get, and that's what we actually need, I will get this. It's a sum of a fixed points, trace of E, X, at the group element of G, determinant of T of X one zero one minus G one. So what you typically do index you will evaluate the group element always. So now I will tell you that if you put this element to trivial to identity, you will just arrive to usual index. So in a way this is much more powerful formula. So I will give you example. So I'm pretty well aware that I wrote for you formula. This formula too is more or less nonsense. This is nonsense. I mean, you just simply, uh, you know, I didn't define for you. The whole catch is the following. If you ask me to calculate the index of operator on the manifold with a action, actually what I need, I need to do a linear algebra at every fixed point. I have to collect certain data and then I can, you know, write my this informations and then for example I can put my group element to one if it makes sense if I mean and then get answer so from now on I will do the example so I wanna this is a general theory I think it would no sense for me just to tell you this stuff so it's much better to do example and then you will have a, a pretty good idea okay Yes. So let's concentrate on examples and uh, but again, uh, let me still warn you so I will consider two examples, of course, CP1 and CP2. But don't get misled that if you want to actually apply for modular manifolds, etc., there is a lot of subtlety. So you actually, if you're ever going to write a scientific paper about this study subject first, don't refer to my lectures, okay? Um, so CP1, which is the same as S2. 
So I actually um, advise you to fill, uh, fill the CP1. So actually try to do different coordinates, etc. So this is defined in the following way, right? So I take a, a zeta 1, zeta 2, right? So this is which belongs to C2 minus a region. And so CP1 is defined, so CP1 is defined as uh, the following thing. It's a zeta 1, zeta 2, identified with lambda zeta 1, lambda zeta 2, <coughs> where lambda is a C star. So C star, it's typically a notation C minus origin. Okay. Now, so there are two patches. So you can cover two by two patches. So first patch is the following. It's, uh, I can introduce for coordinates. So let me see which coordinates I want to choose. Uh, so xi, which would be zeta 2 over zeta 1. And zeta 1 should not be equal to 0. It's one patch. And another patch is, so again, this parameterize me well, because if I'm doing this, I can always parameterize my these things, because it means that if zeta 1 is not 0, I'm basically saying that this point is always the same as zeta 2, zeta 1, 1, right? They cannot be both simultaneously be equal to 0, but they can be equal to 0. So this is lambda, is zeta 1 over zeta 2. So zeta 2 is not equal to 0. Okay, so this is what you are doing. Mm, yeah, well, this is 1, zeta 2 over zeta 1. And this is uh, zeta 1 over zeta 2. 1. Okay. And of course, what you can see here that on intersections, on intersections, um, U1 is U2 is um, psi goes to 1 over, lam uh, over lambda. So this is standard, uh, you know, gluing two things. Okay. So this is would be one of very important examples, and actually this was related to S3. Now uh, remember that I have a U1 action on uh, my CP1. So this, if you wanna write, you like pictures, you write this is just a rotation of this guy. So rotation of the sphere, and there are two fixed points, there is north and south pole. If I discuss this in this coordinates, so uh, I can take parameters. So U1 action in this coordinates is just the following. So this is xi to t xi, and then uh, lambda to t minus lambda. So again, uh, since it's U1, I will typically assume this. Right. Okay, so this is the action. So then uh, let's do the index theorem. So for example, let's pick up uh, my E to be 0, 0 on CP1. And then my uh, another bundle, let me say this will be uh, 0, 1 on uh, CP1. And obviously my operator, so my operator is del bar. It maps E to F. Okay. Then the formula which I wrote there, what you have to do now, so let me first write for the formula and then try to explain every term. So 
So the index, the statement is the following. So the index of del bar operator is 1 minus t minus 1, 1 minus t, 1 minus t minus 1 plus 1 minus t, 1 minus t, 1 minus t minus 1. So if I actually will put t to 1, then uh, upon the thing, so this would be equal to 1. So if t is equal to 1. So uh, what are we doing? So this is contributions of, uh, you know, two fixed points. So actually, you have to look locally, and you have to stir this formula a bit. So what you have to write, you have to write, so I will do it now, but then I will skip all the things, etc. But, uh, so I introduce for you the thing. So what I have to now remember how these guys locally act on, uh, on different forms. So for example, Xi bar obviously goes to T minus one Xi bar. D Xi bar goes to T minus one d xi bar, d xi goes to t d xi, so lambda bar goes to t uh, 1, so this is just lambda bar, <coughs> d lambda goes to t. So all these things, of course, follows from this postul postulated thing. So here, I, for example, fix this is just, I mean, follows from my change of coordinates. Otherwise, it's inconsistent. But the whole data eventually to calculate this contribution, I just need to know things on C. So whole data is associated to C, basically. So then uh, this formula, which I wrote over there, so these things is understood. Yeah. The T lambda bar goes to T. Uh, times d lambda bar, not t inverse. d lambda bar goes to, uh, to t, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So actually what I have here, uh, so my index, if I take this formula and write it better, so index of del bar is equal to sum over fixed points, which is two here. And this is just, I have to take a trace of at E, at my fixed point of T, minus trace of F at T, and then hit tra determinant of uh, a tangent bundle, one minus rho of T. Um, so let me, I don't know how much it's obvious, but <coughs> what I actually have to do, so for example, uh, So everything boils down basically for calculating, I mean, my index and this quantities locally. That's it. So everything is done here at fixed point. Again, here's example. I mean, th the fact is that if I do, so these things cancel, uh, these things cancel, and then, you know, I can, if I don't try this, I will just get a current guy. Um, again, uh, the thing is that if things cancel, this is very obvious what you get. So in a way, the fact that your index is 1 over t, yeah. I'm writing for you things a bit more complicated than they are just to confront this formula. But in a way, these formulas are not that complicated because this is nothing as a 1 over minus t. 
And this is the same as a k from 0 to infinity tk. And that's exactly the example I was giving you last time. And here's the same thing, but here everything will be expanded t minus 1. So in a way, what you are doing, you're just gluing two indices in compatible way of Dalbo operator on C and C. So this is beauty. The thing is that you have to put this thing just to confront marginal formula. But in principle, this form is, formula is simpler than it is. Okay. So this is example number one. It's not actually what we need to calc for calculation. We need something more. Uh, sorry, one question. Yeah. You're evaluating the formula t equals one. Uh, say it again. You are evaluating this the formula for the index at t equals one. Uh, yeah. But then, isn't it like ill-defined? It is ill-defined. Yeah. But you have to expand it and then, you know, evaluate it. And uh, what I'm trying to tell you that, so one, if you would do without equivalence, you can get one. That's the only thing I'm saying. But um, so let me see how to. Well, it's one. I can maybe during exercise class I can tell you this. I mean, in a way, what the only thing what I'm trying to tell you that there is a way to get. So this is non-equivalent index. Non index. Well, it looks like it's just one without any limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Right, so it's one over. Minus t plus 1 minus t minus 1, right? So this is, yeah, exactly. So this is, uh, so this is t minus 1, t, right? Which is 1 minus t minus t, right? Yeah, that's 1. But this is exactly non-equivalent index, which you can calculate right away. OK. What is the role of t? Hmm? So it's a representations, whatever you choose, the representations acting in your forms. So uh, it's a representation. So here it's very trivial. I mean, this is exactly what you get I mean, here. But sometimes when you have a bundle, you may have something more complicated. So this is just abstract thing. OK, let's move. Any other questions? Yeah. So what exactly at EX and FX is the the matrix given the action that you're taking the trace and determinant of, because it's acting on the, I mean, because if, if you wrote 1 minus t in 1 minus t inverse, I'm guessing it's some diagonal matrix to the form 1 minus t, but I don't see where that, how you got that from just this transformation. I don't understand the question, and I don't think I want to answer your question, because, uh, I mean, I'm telling you, I feel very stupid. I'm not giving a lecture on index theorems. I just need this a tool. Those guys ask me, etc. But I actually have to give you like 10 lectures to make a sense of what I'm saying. And I will now systematically avoid any questions because I will not calculate for your partition function of S3 today if I don't, if I start to answer your questions. So just admit that you don't know what I'm saying and then, uh, and then you study. But I told you right away, I mean, it's, I don't know, I feel actually stupid because I have to go and explain for you this formula. I have to explain you uh, how you deal with the things because typically this is distributions. You get delta functions, etc. So typically the index, uh, equivalent index is not a function. It's a distribution on, or, 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 you know, group valid distribution. Because next thing you will start to ask me how to expand the things. So what I'm start to do for you these things, and the more I start to calculate, I mean, the more I will. Uh, there are more. I mean, I have to go to distributions. I don't want to do it actually. So I, I feel a bit stupid. So I admit it. So let me go to another example which we actually needed. So Google it, and I would be happy to answer your question during exercise class. So actually, um, what I want to do another example. So what we need, we need with your ON bundle now for CP1. 
Okay. So the way to construct it is the following. So I will tell you the definition and I will give you some exercises later on. So the definition is the following. So now, so this is a line bundle of a CP1. Okay. And um, it's constructed in the following way. So let me take now three copies of numbers. So zeta 1, zeta 2 belong to C2 minus origin, while zeta 3 just belongs to C. And then I will identify them in the following way, lambda 1, lambda zeta 2, lambda n, zeta 3. So if you do this identification, you will get a total space. It's a line bundle over when bundle of uh, CP1. Okay. <coughs> so what you can do here, you can do similar things what I told, I mean, so I have to introduce coordinates. I mean, you can convince yourself why it's line bundle, etc., but um, so the coordinates is the following. It's xi1 is equal as before zeta1 over zeta2, and xi2 is equal zeta3 over zeta1n, for zeta1 not equal to 0. And then u2 is lambda1 is equal to zeta1 over zeta2, for lambda2 is equal zeta3 over zeta2n, zeta2 not equal to 0. So on the intersections, this would be the following. Xi1 is equal to 1 lambda 1. Xi2 is equal to lambda 2 lambda 1. N. So I hopefully, uh, I'm not just to be faster. I don't want to actually derive this formula. So hopefully I'm just copying from my notes and I'm not making any mistake. So now this is already example of equivalent bundle. So now I'm having this U1 on, uh, so I have my U1. So this is U1 on CP1. Okay. Uh, no, it's not correct. Sorry. Uh, here should be zeta one, right? Sorry. So now what I have to do, I have to postulate now how the section extends on a whole bundle. So xi1 goes to t xi1, xi2 goes to xi2. And then by transformations, I have to, I mean, this line I can postulate. But next line, I cannot postulate, it's derivable. It's a t minus 1 xi, uh, sorry, t minus 1 lambda. So this is what I wrote over there. But then for uh, this coordinate lambda 2, it will t minus n lambda 2. So this is my line bundle. So let me write the index theorem and then um, I will give you a bunch of exercises to do and you will understand why we are doing CP1 and why we are doing ON. So here my bundles will be, it's 2 comma, uh, sorry, 0 comma 0 on S2 with the values in ON and F would be 0, 1 is the values in ON. So they my, my Dalbo operator now, it's a twisted Dalbo. It will act from E to F. So the index will be given by the following formula. Y 
1 minus t minus 1, 1 minus t, 1 minus t minus 1, plus t minus n minus t, 1 minus n, 1 minus t, 1 minus t minus 1. So and eventually, when we will evaluate this, so we will get 1 minus n. That's what I'm interested. So let's do the following. Don't ask now questions. Try to understand these formulas. And tomorrow we have exercise classes. Then you can torture me. OK? Because actually my goal is to show that why this formula is useful within today. Uh, so let me do a number of exercises and that you understand why, I mean, what we are doing is useful for us. So I'm going to do it. So I, it's a lot of now will be um, facts and I ask you to check them. They're very explicit, very nice, etc. Uh, so I have S3. So S3 is the following things, which is written in C2, right, by definition. So then S3 has a T2 action. OK? So T2 action corresponds to the following. Zeta 1 is to E alpha zeta 1, zeta 2 to E beta zeta 2. So you rotate the things. And this, is, of course, preserves this equation. So this is T2 action on S3. Okay. If you take diagonal 1, so when these numbers are coinciding, this corresponds to so diagonal 1. Diagonal 1. This corresponds to U1 acting on S3. And this is exactly the action corresponds to Hopf vibration. So S3, 2. So what I suggest for you to do the following thing. Uh, it's actually, uh, I, mean, peop I mean, the best thing to understand what I'm telling you is just do a very concrete local coordinate uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So just there is a very wonderful coordinates for parameterizing of S3. And this is adapted to the hop vibration. So the coordinates are the following. It's 1. So what did I use? I used uh, 1 plus xi, xi bar, e theta, zeta 2 is 2. E theta xi 1 plus xi xi bar. Right? It solves this condition. So now what I ask you, this is coordinates adapted to Hopf vibration. So what I'm asking you, uh, go to lambda coordinates when lambda is equal to 1 over xi. Right? So I'm using these coordinates which I'm used over there. Okay? And um, I would ask you how theta tilde will change. So this is not globally defined coordinates here, right? So there are two guys. So locally, you can see. So locally, this is actually C times S1. Then you do this change of coordinates, you will get another C times S1. So basically, theta will get a shift related to argument of xi. So that's why, you know, when you glue this sphere, it's not actually, you know, s2 times s1. It's a twisted thing. So as you go around, you will get this twist. So this first exercise, please do it, because this is very nice. And, uh, you know, quite often people say a lot of this formal nonsense. But if you didn't do, I mean, you like this type of calculation, this is bad. Then, 
you can ask, why do we talk about OAN bundles? And that's the whole thing. Again, this is you do it yourself. So my interest is the following. My interest to take a P form on S3, right? So if I look at this thing, right? So if I look at trivial vibration, okay. here. So if I look at trivial vibration, so I'm preparing grounds for calculating determinants. I want to tell you the math, right? So you remember I told you this example. So, for example, if you take a P form on S1 times, uh, sorry, times S2, right? What you will do, it's natural. You just take every form and you expand in Fourier modes here, right? For example, I mean, what we are, would be much more interesting, we would be interested in horizontal forms along S2, which doesn't have any legs. Then you expand in modes, and for you, it's obvious that this is equal to sum over N, and then you would have something like, uh, you know, P form, I mean, N's component over S2, right? I mean, it's a very trivial statement. So just take every form, expand in Fourier modes, et cetera. What we're interested in here is the following. We take uh, any form on S3, so locally it looks like C times S1. So you would like to expand it. The main thing is that S1 is not actually fiber trivial. So the correct statement here, what you will do, so, for example, when, again, you will take a horizontal forms, is the following. This would be a sum over n, and this would be a p form horizontal on S2 valued in ON bundle. Please prove it. So, this is exercise. Prove it. So the way to prove it is the following. Of course, first you write these coordinates, okay? And naively you would say, okay, I can expand in the thing, so I can expand with the mode. And then you have to go around and come back and see how things are changing, and they will change. And the change will be the same as related to N bundle. That's how you identify that this is correct thing. So this is a generalization of Fourier expansion uh, here. And so whatever in future, well, we will do core, I mean, we will do today, hopefully, we will do the determinants of operators on S3. The trick is the following. Whatever we do, we have to reduce on, on S2 ON. Then we basically, our operator, what I call big D, will be Dalbu. We will be, have huge constellations and we actually need to know this N minus one. And that will give me answer, okay? So I suggest for you do all these exercises. Are there any questions? So now I will switch to physics. So remember this n minus 1. And remember this fact. So that we actually can do Fourier modes on S3 with respect to your one action and uh, Any questions? Okay. Uh, are you going to describe index on the three uh, cursor or not? Uh, in the, I, I don't want to talk about index anymore, so that's it. So you just, right now what I'm asking you to remember the following facts that there is some magical thing I calculate index for you. It's, I mean, it's whatever I raised here, right? Then what I'm asking you to, uh, you know, prove this fact, or well, to understand this fact, okay? Uh, the question is, if I write this, this formula, then if I want to calculate some kind of index on the three, uh, I just have to sum up over all this. I'm not interested on in the index on S3. Okay, so why this fact is useful for us? If I why this fact is useful? Because what I will do, Okay. 
You remember at some point I wrote for you this formula. On some kernel of D, and I can write it kernel of D dagger, right? So now I will write for you now gauge theory on S3. I will have lead derivatives here of U1, and this will be just Dalbu operator. So I have to actually know what's a mismatch between norms. So here typically there will be two spaces. One will be zero forms, another will be zero one forms. I have to know mismatch between how lead derivative acts on the kernels of Dalbu operator. And the mismatch is given exactly by one of n. So, you know, that's why I was uh, basically telling you maybe message didn't come across. Maybe it would be much better than I do calculation that I tell you the whole structure. But we always will calculate this. So in a way, I don't care about S3. Eventually, I will reduce everything there. So for me, it's important, right? I mean, I have this lead derivative. So with respect to lead derivative, which U1 I will have, I have to do this mode expansion. And then I have to see how things are, what's a mismatch. So let, let me try to now introduce the actual physical theory. OK. So as a toy model, not, not very toy, but anyway, toy model uh, for 5D, I will now calculate for you a Chen Simons partition function in uh, not the way Witten did. So it's a very nice exercise. So. Um, I would like to calculate. So the goal is to calculate 3D Chen Simons partition function on S3. So my manifold, a big one, I mean. So I will have now, so the setup is the following, that I, I have uh, some uh, principal bundle. Uh, so this is now gauge group, gauge group over my S3, right? So uh, my theory would be the following. So I will have a Chen Simons. I choose a connection. This will be cup over four pi trace of ADA plus 2 over 3 A cube. Okay. And uh, what I would like for you to uh, discuss, I would like to integrate this thing over space of connections, right? So let me call this a space of connections. So in this example, there is very little topology because uh, this is simply connected. I will typically choose the most best semi-simple, simply connected group. So this is bundle of this trivial. So there is nothing to worry about. It. OK? So this is space of connections. At the same time, what I would like to do, I would like to uh, try to construct my uh, thing e equivalently. So right? I would like to doing the same way I did. So what I will do is the following. I would like, uh, so in this story, what is important that I have a, this section of U1 here. So for simplicity, I would assume that my action is uh, just hop fiber. So this is diagonal action, just for simplicity. Then you remember what I told you, right? So, uh, so this is our thing for Tia bot. So something v mu of x. So for example, if you're very, very pedantic, this is where, I mean, I will have here parameter. I don't remember how it was denoted. Let me write phi a v a mu of x. And that's, so if I write everything, so in usual I tell about we ignore this parameter. So let me try to mimic this. So I have my connection and I will go to psi. So psi is a odd one form, odd one form. Delta Psi is equal to, so now what I would like to do, so 
uh, which symmetries I would like to make it equivalent. So I have a space of connections on S3. So on S3, there is a symmetry acting, for example, rotation. So obviously, this symmetry will survive uh, you know, on my uh, space of connections. So what I can write for you, I can write LV, A, plus I will be allowed to write some gauge transformations here. Gauge transformations uh, with some parameters. So let me be very explicit. Uh, so this will be DA phi. And then I would say that So that's what I would like to try to do. So there is a number of problems right away here. So this is sort of very natural thing, uh, I mean, to write. But of course, there is a number of problems, and you have to protest, because uh, if A transforms a connection, how lead derivative transforms, uh, you know, it does not transform well. What you can do, actually, you can redefine slightly, I mean, fields, so you can uh, pull out some things from phi, etc. So you can rewrite these transformations in a bit better way. But this is, in a way, nothing. Uh, and then. So this is rewriting. Let me see if I can. So. You can check that. Uh, so F is just field strength for A. OK? And uh, phi is just I sigma minus I R A. So now sigma, so sigma is a zero form on S3. So there is one thing just for conventions. Of course, they're all Lie, Lie algebra valued. And all fields, connection will be connection, all other fields will be in a joint representation. So I will skip writing this G, but I'm assuming that there is a Lie algebra here. Okay. So this is my model. Now, uh, you can ask, can I write the extension of Chen Simon section, which is invariant under this guy? And the answer, you can do it. So the supersymmetric Chen Simons will be the following. So I take this Chen Simons over there, and I will write A minus uh, I kappa sigma. I will define for you the things minus kappa over 4 pi, kappa over h psi, over h psi. And again, here, where we trace this, everything, the algebra value, et cetera. So you can prove the following very simple fact. Again, let's say it's exercise. You prove it yourself. That uh, delta of this supersymmetric chain Simons is equal to 0 if the following things are satisfied. If uh, kappa is a one form on S3 with the property that IV kappa is equal to 1, and IV d kappa is equal to 0. So this is observable. Uh, what is the R along the chain? Sorry. Uh, I'm having these bad habits of using V and R. R is, uh, because it's contact geometry, it's very, in many places, people use R because it's called a rib vector field. Sorry, it's just. Uh, because I use different conventions, OK? Uh, so now, actually, if you start the section, if you play with the section, it's a current extension of Chen Simon section. Uh, in a way, you could start from this term and just reconstruct Chen Simons by requiring 
to be invariant of this symmetry. So I mean, in a way, you can do things the other way around. Again, remember, so what I'm having here, so my fields A and Psi, this is coordinates on this huge space. One of the things is that when we go to infinite dimensional spaces, I mean, we don't, cannot talk very much about smooth geometry, etc. Although this space is not so bad. I mean, this is a fine space. It, I mean, space of connections are contractible. There is not much topology. But anyhow, what is important that we have T1 naturally defined here. So this is why I was stressing to you. So why localization works? Because there is a canonical measure here. Again, it's sort of hard to comprehend, but I mean, we impose on this geometry here. Okay, and this is section is actually current extension. So this statement is exactly what I told in the final dimensional case. Okay. So now um, the problem is that uh, we would like to calculate something in the theory. And uh, unfortunately, it's not enough uh, to calculate and you need more fields. And you need more fields. Uh, there are two ways of explaining the things. And of course, they're more or less the same. Uh, first way is a physical way. Because if you look at supersymmetry in 3D at vector multiplet, uh, there are two fields are missing. One boson, one uh, uh, fermion. Uh, mathematically, the way I explained to you, it's important when I would write this uh, sort of BRST exact terms, etc. It's important that operators which I get there are the elliptic or transversely elliptic. So I will not be able to do here. So actually the full set of fields which I have to add, so I have to add more fields here. So the full s s transformations will be the following. Then I add chi is h and delta h is l v a chi minus i sigma chi. So here the convention is that l uh, v a. So in this sign there is a covariant a version of Lidirati which is just a d a i v plus IVDA, which is the same as L derivative plus IVA. And I'm not using physics conventions, I hate both sides. Okay. So this is a full multiplet, and mathematically we actually need, otherwise we will not get good theory. Now, a uh, physical thing is that, uh, so this thing is actually one to one. You can map to, uh, n equal to vector multiplet uh, in 3D. So there is exist a map which you can construct. So for example, if you take uh, S3, you look uh, what Kapustin et al. did. I mean, they constructed killing spinner, etc. You, you write all this ugly supersymmetry. Then you take bilinears and you map to the forms. So it's one-to-one -one map. Um, again, the thing is that uh, actually the magic of supersymmetry, so supersymmetry is smarter than we are. So many people do supersymmetry, but they don't understand why it's valuable. I mean, in this supersymmetry, we guarantee to get correct operators. So all our operators will be nice, elliptic, all reality conditions guaranteed, etc. Uh, but I think I'm trying, you know, I hope Guido told you everything about supersymmetry, so I, I'm a free person not to talk about it. Okay. So if you don't know supersymmetry, you need to come up with some, I mean, I mean you need a guesswork, it requires a guesswork as to what kind of fields you add to obtain the transverse elliptic operator and things like that. Uh, well, it requires guess, but I mean, there is... 
there is very systematic procedure. So this is basically theory comes from the lift. So the story is the following. I mean, this you can understand. In fact, it was pointed out in uh, uh, 90s by Nikita, Losef and Bollet. I mean, it's not very cited paper, but they were saying that you take elliptic problem in d dimensions, and this is just a natural lift in d plus one dimension, etc. So there is totally systematic way to do it. So I will, in a moment, I will write for you some operators, and actually I will confront what I told you during first lecture, why are operators, etc. So in a way, everything works, and works beautifully mathematically and physically. The main thing what I'm trying to stress that um, I mean. I used to work in, uh, you know, in supersymmetry with people like Rochik, etc. And he would always say his phrase was that super feels smarter than we are. <laughs> so this is an incredibly good thing because you learn a few tricks and I mean, yeah. supersymmetry, it tells you how to do things. But eventually if you write everything, wow, everything works. I mean, operators elliptic, determinants are calculable, etc. You try to deviate from this framework and everything fails. So, I mean, supersymmetry are smarter than we are. That's a statement. <laughs> okay, so now I have to write for you a uh, BRST exact term, right? So this is again, always confront the things against uh, what I told you before. <coughs> right, and um, and the answer was uh, actually, so you get something, so you evaluate a zero form, et cetera, and this is determinant of dv. So let's do it. So let's write this burst exact term. So delta w will be delta of psi mu star delta of psi mu bar plus chi. Sorry, I didn't tell you that chi is odd zero form and h, so this is odd fermionic, and this is even zero form. So now if you uh, count odd forms here, this is one form, it's a three component, this is zero component, so in total four components, this is exactly a Dirac spinner in four dimensions. So that's why there is a map. Then you write this, and then you will write uh, star H minus F horizontal. So I, I didn't tell you, so of course in this setting, uh, I will presumably discuss more tomorrow. So I have these conditions, IV on kappa equal to one. So I can decompose any forms to vertical plus uh, horizontal guys by just applying a projector. This is kappa of HIV. This is one minus kappa of HIV. Okay. Uh, so just now let's think about, so this is whole catch is that I'm looking at two forms in three dimensions, right? So then I would decompose a vertical part of two forms plus horizontal part of two forms. So how many components vertical part will have? I'm asking students that you don't decouple. Okay, let's give you a simple equation. How many components F has in three dimensions? Be, be brave. How many? Three. three, good. Then you have to take a p three, so what's the decompositions here? No, two plus one. So it's two, it's one. Because uh, here I take F and contract with V. So the only index is one free, it's like a vector, but it cannot be alone V, so it's two components and this. So it means that F horizontal, it's actually one component. So you can think this, I mean, uh, actually you can map it naturally to zero forms. That's why I'm uh, writing this condition. It makes sense. Okay, so now 
moreover, what you can see, so here always exist, if you look at this example, uh, there is a compatible metric. So a re actually round metric, if you take a V and contract, you will get kappa. So actually, these two spaces are orthogonal with respect to scalar product. Prove it. Exercise. Exercise. Uh, if I choose for you a metric, I choose this decomposition, they're orthogonal. So the whole catch here, so if I start to write the things again, so I'm looking at bosonic things and I combine, I will get F star F. Again, this term gives me F horizontal square, this term gives me F vertical square, plus DA sigma, which star D sigma plus the stuff related to odd guys. Okay. So here the my localization locus will be F equal to zero, sigma equal to constant. And this is just a one, one isolated point. Because the only uh, flat connection on S3 is just trivial connection. You can do this calculation more complicated manifolds and then life becomes a bit more complicated. That's why I choose this. Okay. So I actually have one fixed point and then I have to do it. So now um, there are some subtleties which I'm not going to discuss, but actually what we do, we have to apply this formula directly there. So the partition function will be the following. It will be integral over constant sigma. So my, I mean, it's isolated in these directions. Here I have, of course, uh, sigma is a constant. Then I have to evaluate my action at my fixed point, which would be E minus some number trace of sigma square. And then I have to write for you these guys. And I'm writing for these guys, right? So. The first line, it's mapping from even, so everything is linearized level. So at linearized level, this is actually one forms. So I'm mapping one forms even to odd one forms. So then what I will have here, I will have here a determinant of a one form on S3 of LV plus adjoint of sigma. I'm a bit skipping how I get the adjoint, etc. But roughly speaking, if you assume that, uh, okay. Now, another part of thing is that uh, this goes here. So this is zero form now. It goes from here to here. So then what I will get, I will get a determinant of zero form on S3. LV plus at sigma. Now that's a story which I didn't tell you yet, but as you know very well as a physicist, you have to gauge fix it. So there are three fields I'm missing. In fact, this field has a super partner. It's related to the ghost. So there will be more fields. There will be fields C, C bar, B. And actually, uh, so C, is related to sigma, uh, then uh, these guys as a super partners, etc. So actually, these two, f I mean, fields, so there is a purely systematic procedure to get them. So I told you there is this uh, Matai equivalent formalism which uh, is built in, etc. But uh, basically, having CC bar, it contributes me the following thing it's a determinant of zero form of exactly the same operator. Okay? So that's what we have to calculate. That's what gets from localization. Uh, again, I did not explain to you this term, but uh, I will try to draw maybe next time diagram. Again, I'm, I didn't have enough time. Actually, I wanted to spend for this more than half of the lecture, I mean, index theorems were just small deviation. So the whole goal is that this is supposed to be a partition function of Chern-Simon S3 and 
according to localizations, so that's what I have to get now. So now we actually have to calculate. So there is, uh, I'm going to do it in a smart way, but on S3 you can do it in a <coughs> not smart way, the way Kapustin did. I mean, he's a smart guy, but you know. Uh, what you can do actually, uh, and that's, you write this thing, right? You expand everything up to quadratic order, you get Laplacians, and you calculate their ratios. So you can do the way exactly as I told you at the first thing. You can actually calculate these determinants of these things. Because it's actually group manifold, you know so much about harmonic analysis, you can do it. That's the way Anton did the original cal these calculations. So this is totally fine. Since you have a localization, you just can put a parameter and only quadratic terms are contributing. This is Laplacian. So you actually can do these things. So this is, in fact, it's another step when you actually go to this formula. I'm contrasting to you these things because sometimes in localization community, people tend to do these calculations, which is, in principle, much harder. But if you know about manifold too much, then you can do it. So S3 is one of these examples. OK. So now the whole idea here, what we have to do, and that's why I was telling you about index theorems, is the following that you have to actually <coughs> start to expand these guys. So for example, uh, so one form, right, you can expand in the following things. This will be a vertical guy, one form, plus it will be a horizontal guy. But horizontal will have one, zero, plus horizontal, zero, one. So vertical guys, it's just one component. Five minutes, OK. Less. Hmm? Less. Less. Oh, you're already for two minutes showing me. OK. Uh, right. So this is, has a zero component. So this is actually zero forms. So now if you start to look, is that here I have a one operator, zero forms in power 3 over 2. Then one of them will cancel. And here, this is more or less the same spaces. Let me ignore <laughs> the face. But face here is very, very important. You have to take a square root in a clever way. It's responsible in the quantum level for the shift of uh, a level of Chan Simon. So let me ignore the phase. But so actually, if I take square root of this, then my answer will be the following. So I will have a d sigma e minus some number trace of sigma square. And then here, I will get a determinant of zero form LV plus adjoint, and then determinant of horizontal 1,0 form LV plus adjoint of sigma. So now actually, because of all nonsense I told you before, and it didn't come across presumably, uh, but the thing is there is this DH operator here, which is transversely elliptic. Okay, so one of the things, for example, what I told you is that I can take these guys and expand in the zero in uh, the exercise I was giving before. So I can expand, so I have to finish, uh, I will talk tomorrow. So one of the ways is to do the following, you can expand these guys, okay? Because when you expand in mods, you know very well what the value of this operator will be, right? Because LV on my form, n will be 2 pi i n omega n. The only thing is now this guy takes values. This is a form on S2 uh, with values in on. So it means that this guy, when I expand in the mods, will have a value 2 pi i n plus sigma. Now what I actually have to go to the kernel of this operator and see what's minus much of the mods are. And roughly speaking, I have to finish. Let me say one thing. What I will get here, I will get 1, 2 pi i n plus adjoint of sigma in whatever n uh, and minus 1, something like this. Mm. 
again, if you want, you, I have to finish now. You can play yourself uh, with the things and convince. But the steps is the following, that you take these guys, you can expand in mods, and then you can go to kernel. There is a huge consolation. This is the only thing which is left. And this is overall, and I have to sum up. I mean, I'm a bit sketchy. I have to actually think differently when it's n positive and negative, etc. But this is the whole idea, and that's the answer. Now, if you take this function, you plug it in here, you calculate everything, you get what Witten got end of 80s. So this is exactly the same result. And um, yeah. So I will stop here. So I'm sorry. Again, I think I suffer the same problem. I didn't have time, but uh, I spent too much time on the index theorems. But this is much more important. So tomorrow I will comment about this. I will tell you this result. Write some diagram, again, stressing for some sequence, and then give you 5D theory again, very axiomatically. Uh, just tell you briefly how it's related to supersymmetry, but I will not actually talk about this. So, okay, thank you. <laughs>